fellow spooky friends, and welcome to another episode of the Scary Podcast. Woo! I'm Rob Grace of Zam Diaz, and Hello. today we're bringing you guys some cool things. Indeed. It might be a little bit depressing, I guess. Indeed we are. I think mine ends on a happy note. Okay, good. I'm not sure about yours, but I am excited to hear yours. I don't know what it is, I just know that it involves aliens. Yeah, so I I'm sent out of the excited. aliens gif earlier. <laughs> it's a good gif. It's not just him going aliens, but it's him getting abducted as well. Uh, I'm going to be covering the fifth installation of the Haunted Hollywood series, which I am very excited to do. And uh, I'm I'm like excited to do this, so I'm not going to put anything in the description that states exactly which movie I'm covering, but like allude to which movie I'm covering. All right. Um, but I will be unveiling it for you all here shortly, because I'm going to go first this episode. But before we do that, I'd like to remind you all that it is January, which means... January Patreon push. It's just such an annoying sound. It really it's such is. An annoying but it's also sound. fun. It's a fun sound to make uh, with your mouth. My sister last night, she was just like, you know, they have an air horn app for that. I was so excited. And then some people during the live show were saying that they do the noise when I do it. Oh, but I gosh. skipped it last week because you, I didn't want to annoy you last week. And they're like, they were so sad that I skipped it. So I'm happy I did it this week. So January Patreon push is one month out of the year where we encourage you wonderful folks to go to patreon.com slash scarish podcast it is the patreon account we have set up so that you can contribute to us financially if you are able to do so to support the content we create so we can create better and more importantly more content for you folks for as little as a dollar a month that is four quarters you get early access to all of our content and ad free access to all of our content and i will say that coming up here shortly, the ad should be functioning again. Oh, really? So January was essentially a preview month of what it's like when you have signed up for a dollar a month through patreon.com slash scarish podcast. We have increasing amounts of tiers that give you additional stuff along with all the tiers you've purchased before. Or I should say all the tiers that come before that. For instance, our $10 tier gets you a piece of merch every season with a new logo designed by... And then created, whatever uh, merchandise you're getting has been created by Robin and is sent to you directly along with early access as well as the ability to choose your own adventure, things like that. Uh, so please go over to patreon.com slash scarish podcast, check out those tiers and consider signing up for a monthly donation. They really do help us out quite a bit. And at 150 patrons, we are going to travel to the Stanley Hotel to see the place The Shining was inspired by. So very excited to get there. Hopefully you folks can go over, sign up, and get us one step closer to that. So that is the January Patreon push promotion. Pretty <laughs> excited that it's over. Are you just saying peas for fun? Yeah. I started doing alliteration, plus I'm testing my pop filter. Seemed to work out okay, so that's a good thing. Um, besides that, we are going to be recording live our Storytime episodes on Tuesdays from now on. So Tuesdays at 6.30 p.m. So Pacific Standard Time. So if you're listening to this on Monday... It's tomorrow. If you're listening or, to this I mean, on Monday, you're a time traveler I mean, and a Tuesday. goddamn wizard. If, if, if this is Tuesday morning, it's tonight. It would be tonight. It's the day of release from now on until Robin's semester is over. Then we might consider switching it. However, we are excited to see some new folks show up for Tuesdays. And I know a lot of folks want to jump in there and see what it's like. We read the stories that have been sent to us by the wonderful listeners live. And we get some audience reaction. We react with you guys. There's a lot of stuff that happens on the side that does not make the finished podcast that comes out on Fridays. So please stop by and hang out with us. It is really, really fun. We'd love to see you there. YouTube.com slash scaryish or twitch.tv slash scaryish podcast. Tuesdays, 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And if you have a story you would like to submit for us to read, please email storytime at scaryish.com or go to our website, scaryish.com, and click on Contact Us or visit any of our social medias and hit us up there. You can message us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Whatever works for you, we look forward to hearing from you. So all that stuff said, I think I'm going first, right? Yeah. You go, girl. All right. So, oh, I didn't I didn't turn my monitor. So Robin does this thing where she listens very intently, and if she enjoys one of my topics, she occasionally, not frequently, but occasionally will glance over at my script and try and get some spoilers. And, like, she'll sometimes, like, gasp at something I haven't said yet, and I'm like, no, you're ruining it. So I need to turn my monitor so that she can't get spoilers before I get started. Okay, right. cool. Here we go. So this week I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to cover, but... I do keep checking how long it has been since I did A Haunted Hollywood. I do this all the time, mainly because they're some of my favorite things that I am able to cover on this show. 
Uh, it includes my three favorite things, basically. Movies, the paranormal, and grisly deaths. What and the F? <laughs> although this will mark the shortest interval between Haunted Hollywood episodes, I think the last one was episode 103, and this is episode 112, so it was only nine. I'm not apologetic about it, because I think this is a really good topic. You folks respond very well to them. So I just love them so much, I decided that I wanted to go through with this. And this time around, I will be covering one of the most famous movie curses that I've ever heard of that has been around for quite some time. So prepare yourselves, spooky friends, for the curse of Superman. So I will be fair here and state that this one doesn't just apply to Hollywood. It's mostly applying to Hollywood. Comic books too, or...? It applies to the entire franchise. Uh, The curse, in air quotes, curse, is said to have affected folks who have worked on various forms of media. So television, comic books, movies, basically anything that's attached to the Man of Steel. And like all of the curses that we cover, this definitely has real events that occurred, but comes with the caveat that it may all be bullshit. A lot of people have worked on Superman in one way or another, so given that super large sample size... Some shit is just going to happen. Like, that's just how life goes. That said, there are some high-profile actors who were involved heavily with Superman that did have bizarre things happen in their life. Typically, when the tragic and the bizarre have some form of common thread between the two, folks tend to take notice of what that common thread is, and in this case, it is the Superman franchise. A good example of the type of events that took place in this quote-unquote curse, which I'll put in quotes... Uh, for the last time here, is that of the first man to ever portray Superman in a live-action role by the name of Kirk Allen. So in 1948, Kirk Allen put on the blue and red spandex for the movie serial Superman. A few things. They weren't actually blue and red. They were, like, gray and black, I think, because it filmed better because the film was black and white. Ah, I see. Okay. The promotional poster showed Superman in an all-red outfit, which is just so annoying. Um, I mean, it could have been the Superman from... He doesn't even uh, have an all-red costume. He has the hammer and sickle on there, and there's some other colors tossed in besides red. So, aside from that, another side note, so a side side note, you might not know what a movie serial is. Um, So, essentially what it is, is like a TV show. What we know to be a TV show where things are released episodically, except that these were released in the theaters. They typically come out... Um, each week on the same day, so similar to how we go back and watch movie or how we watch TV nowadays, unless it's like Netflix or whatever, where they just drop an entire season on us now, which is fairly new. You know that yeah. that, that that never happened before, like streaming services, which I absolutely adore because you can just just binge an entire series in one night, which is amazing and probably really unhealthy for you. Netflix hit us up, right? <laughs> Sponsor us. Superman had fifteen chapters that totaled two hundred and forty four minutes. So definitely too long to be a single film because 120 minutes is two hours. Long movies are around two and a half. I think Avengers Endgame was like six and a half hours. It was hard to tell. It was, really long enough. But it was like three different movies all together. It was very long. I still enjoyed it quite a bit. Uh, 244 minutes. To that point in his career, Kirk had been in around 30 projects. He was uncredited, so not given credit for the role that he played in them for around two-thirds of what he was in. So it wasn't exactly burning up the silver screen, okay? After Superman, it really didn't change much. He had a couple other serials, but the remainder of his roles, aside from those serials, and I sincerely think there's only two of them, the remainder of his roles would go uncredited from like 1948, 1952, around there. That's so sad. All the way till the 80s. He basically was trying to get work that entire time. He couldn't find it. And it is said that due to that... He battled depression and alcoholism throughout his life and was only remembered for his time spent as Superman. He didn't suffer a short life, though, which is a good thing. He lived till he was 88. He did have Alzheimer's at the end of his life, which was listed as the official cause of his death. Not so good. In 1999. So he did have a very long life. He was the first live action Superman. It is pretty cool, but he suffered from the fact that he was typecast and depressed because he was not able to find other work, which is very human, you know? Yeah. It's not like something super paranormal. It happens to a lot of people in that business. It really does, and that's the thing I don't like about audiences nowadays, is when someone gets cast as something that's very different from the role you traditionally see them in... They're like, I hate it. People complain, (laughs) like, I can't believe they cast Heath Ledger as the Joker. How'd that fucking work out? Maybe shut your mouths for a sec and just think... 
is he a good actor? Can he do a good job? Because that tends to work out just saying, Henry Cavill, The Witcher, yeah, where's all those people that told me I was wrong about how fucking good he was going to be about a year ago when they cast him, or however long ago it was. I got ripped apart on Facebook for being happy about that casting, and those same fucking people are posting Toss a Coin to Your Witcher videos. (laughs) So I am owed an apology from quite a few people. But that said... I'm going to get back to this specific curse. And Henry Cavill's brought up again later in oh, my script. Oh, my goodness. Okay. I mean, Well, he is a man of steel, so. Exactly. So, he died in 1999. He was the first live-action Superman, but he wasn't the first Superman. A man named Bud Collier voiced Superman on the radio show, The Adventures of Superman, that started in 1940. So, way back when... And in the Superman cartoons of the 1940s as well. Kirk Allen may have been the face of Superman, but Bud Collier was the voice. Undoubtedly. And he went on to do pretty well career-wise, in fact. He wound up as a game show host for a couple of game shows. Beat the Clock, which I don't really remember. And To Tell the Truth, which I absolutely do remember. It wasn't all when I was alive, but I remember it because To Tell the Truth was absolutely awesome. Four celebrities would come out, and then three other people would come out... And sit opposite them on a stage, okay? The three people that came out after the celebrities were all pretending to be the same person. It was some person of note or person of interest or someone who went through something significant in their life. And at the uh, onset of the show, the host, Bud here, would read something about the person or read something from a memoir or from something that happened in their life. And then after that, the celebrities got to ask these individuals questions. They got to pick which one they thought may or may not be the real person and ask them about the event. And at the end of the show, they would guess who the real whoever was. The end of the show, Bud Collier would say, will the real so-and-so please stand up? And yes, that is where Eminem is referencing in the song The Real Slim Shady. Will the real Slim Shady please stand up? But that's what he's referencing. The whole pause thing is from To Tell the Truth. What? Like that's where that came from. And I don't think a lot of people fucking realize that. No. If this show sounds familiar to you, but you've never seen it, if you've seen the movie Catch Me If You Can, you have seen an iteration of this show. Because they have it play out at the very beginning where they have three people come out claiming to be Frank Abagnale Jr., the main character from the show. Catch me if you can. Leonardo DiCaprio is one of them. And then they show how the celebrities would ask questions to these people. And the, the question that sparks the entire movie is the memory of who caught him. And that is actually something that took place. Frank Abagnale Jr. was absolutely a real person. He was absolutely on this show. Wow. And so it's just a recreation of when he actually attended the show. By I the way... I did not know any of this. He's still alive. Frank Abagnale Jr. What? He's 100% still alive and probably filthy fucking rich. He's like one of the biggest consultants. Because he works with the FBI and yeah, stuff. Yeah, on like counterfeiting <laughs> and oh con man shit. And that's just super cool. We're going to get back now to Superman. Because to tell the truth was hosted by Bud Collier. So, Bud got brought back in 1966 for the new adventures of Superman to voice the character again. I think it was on CBS That's an animated this time. one? Okay. It's another animated one, correct. In 1969, though, Bud died of a circulatory ailment. He was Aww. only 61. So he was relatively young, and that's a shame. But it's not, like, super cursy. You know, he had a good life, he had a long career, seems like he did well. So let's stick with the folks who represented Superman, uh, the character. And we're going to move on to George Reeves. And he was cast as Supes for the 1951 movie Superman and the Mole Men. Some of you might know George Reeves if you've like read any iteration of the Superman curse before. If you've seen the movie Hollywood Land, he's pretty famous. Uh, Superman and the Mole Men was successful and a television series was developed called Adventures of Superman. It would last for six seasons and have a total of 104 episodes aired. Wow. Getting over 100 is a big deal. Yeah. Um, It's pretty awesome that he had that much success with the role, but there was a lot going on behind the scenes. Uh, George Reeves has had much spoken, written, and made into film about his life. I mentioned Hollywood Land that came out in 2006, where George Reeves is played by Ben Affleck. Um, That's a really intense movie. And to put this succinctly, uh, Reeves was typecast as well. And struggled to find other work. And alcohol and yeah, depression... I don't remember him in anything. George Reeves? 
I mean, I'll get to it too. He has like one role later after he was cast as Superman that he was excited about. Okay. And uh, but I'm, I'll I'll cover that. So it's sad. Um, but oh, he gosh. did also okay. suffer with alcohol and depression, and he dealt with it on a daily basis. And the Superman show was in flux in 1958, and it wasn't exactly canceled, but it wasn't like in active production. In 1959. Filming was supposed to start again on two additional seasons that they had, like, scripts ready to go, and they had all the episodes planned out. There was a setback that was suffered when John Hamilton, who was the actor who played Perry White, the owner of the Daily Prophet, or maybe the person who runs it. Okay. I forget exactly which. I'm pretty sure he's just the one who runs it. He doesn't own it. Um, I think Bruce Wayne owns it, actually. <laughs> Anyways, I'm okay. Uh, the actor, <laughs> John Hamilton, who played him, died in October of 1958. So they're getting ready to get this show back into production, and one of the main characters in the show passes away. So another actor was hired to replace the character, but they decided it wasn't going to be the same character. It would be the character's brother. And I would imagine at this point in production, people are like, wow, that's really sad, but we're going to move forward and, and the show should be okay. Then June of 1959 happened, and everything changed. And I really think this is when the Superman curse, so to speak, started being talked about. So, on the evening of June 15th, 1959, George Reeves and his fiancée, Lenore Lemon, had gone out for the evening for a bit of entertainment. Some accounts state that uh, they went to a restaurant with a friend named Robert Condon, who was a writer. Other accounts state that the couple went to wrestling matches involving Jean LaBelle, who is a friend of George Reeves. Uh, it's not exactly confirmed where they went, in the account where they went to the restaurant with their friend, it said that they had an argument in front of him that got heated mm -hmm. before they all returned to their home. Again, not 100% confirmed either way. What is confirmed is that after returning home, Reeves went to bed, and he eventually was woken up around midnight okay. when William Bliss and Carol Van Ronkel, which is just like a 1950s name if I've ever heard it, yeah. showed up and Lenore, his fiance, commenced an impromptu party. Um, several other folks also wound up coming over and the noise woke him up around midnight. He came downstairs and to put it bluntly, he bitched them out until he just said screw it and he just joined them. Okay. He had some drinks. Um, he was in a generally down mood according to the guests and at 1.30 a.m., he said goodnight, and he retired to his bedroom, apparently still I mean, in a bad mood. I mean, if someone was like... I'd be pissed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, imagine if... I'm sleeping, motherfucker. <laughs> regardless of what happened when we went out to dinner or went to a wrestling match, imagine if you came home, went upstairs, and went to sleep, and you woke up to neighbors and friends that came over, and I was like, party! Loud enough where you had to wake up and come downstairs and tell us to shut the hell up. Like, who would expect you to be in a good mood? You know what I mean? Yeah, no. So he Rude. stayed down there till 1.30 a.m., said goodnight, retired to his bedroom, still in the bad mood apparently, shortly after a single gunshot rang out from the bedroom. Oh, no. William Bliss ran upstairs to find Reeves laying back on his bed with his feet still on the ground, dead of a gunshot wound to his head. Oh, my God. Head. So this isn't even the craziest part. Like, it's sad. His death is very sad, but it gets really crazy. The first thing that's really weird about this is they don't call the police immediately. And they don't really apologize for it. And that's something that, like, is exactly how it's written in a lot of places. Mainly because they were heavily intoxicated, they were shocked, and they didn't know what to do. And they all said that. But anytime you don't call the police when something like that happens, it gets really fishy. Yeah. You know what I mean? I wouldn't trust it at all. But they said that they didn't call the po police because they were freaked out and they were completely hammered. And this is believed by the police, who were eventually called, uh, because once they arrived to take statements, the guests were all absolutely shit-faced. It was hard to understand what they were saying, let alone put together an account of the night's events. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was officially ruled a suicide, and it was ruled that fairly quickly. But it's pretty weird shit that came out afterwards. So, Lenore Lemon was officially in quotations downstairs with the guests at the time of the gunshot but there are a lot of folks who dispute this and why here would are, she kill him though here's the thing well like she mocked him quite a bit because he had all this ambition and he wasn't succeeding and he was very resentful of the success that he had through superman because it was apparently the only success that he could find you know yeah and she was just kind of like you're a loser 
That's that's really what it comes what off as bitch. to me. So let me <laughs> let me see if you guys get the same impression because I'm going to read you two accounts of the incident. There are lots of accounts of this incident, but here's the two that stuck with me that I decided I needed to share. The first is that she was downstairs, and once he went upstairs brooding, she supposedly stated to all the guests, "quote He's probably going to go shoot himself." <gasps> Shut the front door. Then they heard a noise upstairs, and she said, "quote." He's opening a drawer to get the gun. And then they heard the gunshot. And she said, see there? I told you so. What a... F- what? <laughs> yeah. So I think the word you're looking for is fucking bitch. Uh, that's one account. The other account doesn't have her saying anything nearly as hate-filled. This other one is told third hand. And this is where the source well, comes from. I feel like that first one is someone who probably was like, she was kind of a biznatch. And this is probably what she was like, you know, instead of what actually happened. So this one that I'm about to tell you is told third hand of a friend, from a friend, I should say, of George Reeves. Um, He claims that William Bliss, who was there, the one who discovered the body after the shot, told a friend after everything was starting to get investigated, but did not tell the police the friend was named Maliciant? M-I-L-L-I-C-E-N-T, which just looks like Maleficent. Uh, Millicent? Millic- Millicent Trent, thank you. Uh, after all this happened, that when the shot was heard, Lenore came bounding down the stairs because she had been upstairs and said to him, Tell them I was down here. Tell them I was down here. And that's all she said to him. What the f? Well, okay, so with that one, maybe she didn't do it. Maybe she wasn't the one that did it, but she was there when he I did it. I don't think she murdered him. I think she taunted him because she was shit faced and he was depressed. And he just and he was pissed did. at her because she was trying to have a good time. And he was like, "I just want to be home alone." At midnight, I get woken up, and you guys are all acting like super drunk assholes. You know what I mean? And like, I'm the asshole for wanting to be for wanting peace and quiet. Yeah. yeah. So. Here's some other stuff, though. Reeves had also been involved in an affair with a married woman named Tony Mannix. Now, if you're older, you might recognize this name. Probably not, though. She was the wife of MGM Vice President Eddie Mannix, wow. who was a very powerful man and supposedly had ties with the mafia. There are plenty of theories about his murder being arranged by either her or her husband, and she supposedly confessed to arranging for his murder on her deathbed, but... She also had Alzheimer's at the end of her life when the confession supposedly took place. Although there is one witness who claims to have overheard a confession from her to a priest in her later years prior to Alzheimer's setting in where she claimed as much to the priest and then prayed to God and to George Reeves for forgiveness. Wow. So all this is hearsay and conjecture. Yeah, obviously. So what does the evidence say? Well, the evidence says he battled depression and alcoholism and struggled to be seen as anything but a role he grew to resent. He had a part in From Here to Eternity. And that part he was super excited about. He thought it could move him out of his traditional role as Superman and maybe let him do some actual acting again, not just doing the same thing over and over. Uh, When the premiere happened, when he came on screen, someone in the audience or several folks in the audience shouted, There's Superman! And they all laughed. What? So, it, like, imagine, like, being super excited about, I'm going to do something different, like, I'm stretching my wings, and I'm going to actually have this new role, and as soon as you show up, people basically mock you, because all they see you as is Superman. Oh, that sucks. And that's what happened to him during the premiere from Here to Eternity. So, what is the physical evidence state? Well, it's a bit odd, and here's a few things that you might find as odd as well. You might not be conspiracy theorists, you all know that I'm not. But I do point out when things don't make sense. So a few things that don't make sense. One, the gun that was used to fire off the bullet that killed him didn't have any fingerprints on it. Not his. Oh, what? Not anyone else's. It was discovered. So it was Completely wiped. wiped clean of any fingerprints, which typically doesn't happen after you shoot yourself. That's sketchy. <laughs> Reeves' hands had no residue on them <laughs> from a gunshot. That's also sketchy. Although the practice of testing for gunshot residue wasn't a normal thing, so they may just not have checked, but his hands supposedly had no residue on them from a gunshot. The bullet that killed him was embedded in the bedroom ceiling, indicating that it was shot straight up, which does seem to indicate suicide. suicide. Yeah. But there were two other bullets lodged in the floor of the bedroom. All fired from the same gun, determined so like, conclusively. The gun was fired three times. So it's like there was a struggle or something? That's exactly where my head went, too. 
Everyone there stated that they only heard one shot. No one deviated from that ever. But there was three bullets discovered having been discharged, two on the floor, one from, in the ceiling. From the same night? Um, it, it appeared from the same night, from the same like round of shooting. The one that had killed him was the one that wound up in the ceiling, though. One shell casing was discovered at the scene. The other two shell casings were never found. That shell casing was discovered under his body. So, supposedly what happened is he sat at the foot of his bed with his feet on the ground, put the gun under his neck or under his chin and shot himself. And that round somehow made its way around him. So when he collapsed on the bed, which would have happened very quickly, he landed on it. Which is just bizarre, you know? It doesn't make a lot of sense. And they very quickly determined it to be a suicide. Reeves' mother hired an attorney who had a second autopsy performed, which also eventually was ruled to be a suicide. But during that second autopsy... There were multiple bruises to Reeves' head and body discovered that it happened the same night as his death. Like he got beaten That were never explained. They don't know exactly where it came from, whether it was striking, struggling, he ran into something. It was just bruises on his body that they had no official word for. So they decided since they couldn't determine it, it must still be a suicide. So it is still officially ruled a suicide. And I guess Hollywood Land, because I've never seen it, is about someone trying to piece together what actually happened to him. And they have three iterations of what could have happened to him. And the last of which being the possible suicide that happened. I've never seen it. I know Adrian Brody is the main character in it who's investigating it. But if you're in for like a depressing murder mystery, go ahead and check that one out. Then, the new generation rolled around in 1978. A new movie was released called Superman the Movie. And this one was a big deal. The new Superman that was cast was Christopher Reeve, not Reeves. A lot of people call him Christopher Reeves, and no one can blame you because they sound very similar. Yeah. They're also not related at all. Yeah. This particular well, I mean, movie... if one's Reeves and one's Reeve, of course they're yeah. not related. <laughs> this particular movie has more associated with it as the curse than any other single iteration... Because of what happened to ...of him. the curse. Because of how many things happened to so many people in the original oh, Superman movie. Because right, it's right. not just Christopher Reeve. So, let's jump into these. During the movie, you see a baby Kal-El, otherwise known as Clark Kent slash Superman, and it's an actual baby. The baby's name is Lee Quigley, which is a pretty cute cute name. Oh no, is something bad going to happen? Oh no! Lee grew up to the age of 14, where he did some silly stuff that kids do. He inhaled solvents. And when I was a kid, we called it huffing paint. Because you essentially breathe in fumes from something like so he paint was just thinner, like, I want to get high. Or nail polish remover. He's a 14-year-old kid is like, I want to get high. Which kids do. Kids do stupid shit. You know what I mean? I... Gets you dizzy, a little bit high for a short amount of time. I don't remember doing any of this shit. <laughs> well, so you were I'm straight like... edge. So I didn't huff paint or anything like that. But I did stupid you shit You know what too. I did? I put marker on my hands. And then I put Elmer's glue on it. And when it dried, I peeled it off and had rainbow glue. That's You're what I did. You're fucking crazy. <laughs> You were so close to sniffing that glue, you don't even know. (laughs) Anyways, it's bad for you. Like most things that get you high, it's bad for you. And Lee Quigley, at 14 years old, died from inhaling solvents. Is it just like it just started melting his brain? I think it was a really bad reaction to a single incident. I don't think he was like addicted to it. It's just you're inhaling like absolutely toxic chemicals the feeling of getting high what is solvent? your body's reaction to it it doesn't state specifically oh, okay. which one but there's a lot of different ones basically anything that's like really bad for you to smell you smell it and your reaction is like oh. i mean i've sat in the garage like a closed garage with paint thinner before <laughs> that's not good and also don't do that with your car because that will also kill you so the lesson there don't huff paint kids grown-up superman we all know him we all love him christopher reeve has probably the most famous affliction of the curse, which you already referenced, you alluded to. Some of you are younger that listen to us. You may not know this, but uh, Christopher Reeve, the man who played Superman in 1978, on May 27th, 1995, his horse, Buck, that he was riding to prepare for competition and had already competed with multiple times. Did it buck him off? Kind of. It stopped suddenly after starting a jump, which I think is called like a refusal. I saw it somewhere online. There's an actual name for it. But it's like your body's going forward already. You have all the speed and momentum from the horse, and the horse just like, nope, and just stopped. And you're just to go over the jump. So his momentum carried him over the horse. His hands tangled in the reins like he was still holding on to them. They became entangled. He had so much momentum, it pulled the bridle and the bit off of the horse. Oh, no. He went over the gate or over the fence, and he landed on the ground head first. So he shattered his C1 and C2 vertebrae, 
which for those of you who don't know which ones those are, it's the two just below your skull. So it's like skull, C1, C2. He shattered it and he irreparably damaged his spinal cord. I didn't know a lot about this. So when I was reading it, I'll be straight up when I was reading this stuff about Christopher Reeve. I cried. Oh, no. I was like, holy shit, this is so sad. Like, I didn't know any of this. So he actually stopped breathing for three minutes. Um, Which is even more brain damage. Yeah, the paramedics got to him really quickly. They got him breathing again within three minutes, but his lungs emptied out and he didn't breathe for three minutes. I mean, getting thrown like that will knock the air out of him. And on top of that, it's like this traumatic neck injury where your body just goes immediately into shock. Um, and I did consider leaving this part out, but I want to repeat it for you folks because it does have a good message. So don't get too trigger warning, trigger warning on this. Um, but according to the book Christopher Reeve wrote, and his book is called Still Me, uh, once he came to afterwards, which took several days, he wow. was in like a bunch of like pain medication. He was waking up and he was delusional and he thought people were after him. And it like it really scared the people around him. After several days, he kind of came to and they realized, oh, he's lucid. And they gave him his diagnosis. His diagnosis was he's never going to be able to walk again, and he will likely never be able to move any part of his body ever again. So I think in that situation, none of us can really imagine what that would be like. No. And he considered suicide. And he said to his wife, Dana, quote, this is according to him in his book, he said, quote, maybe we should let me go. And she cried, which is obvious, and told him, quote, I am only going to say this once, which is something badass women say to you when they don't want to put up with your shit. I am only going to say this once. I will support whatever you decide because this is your life and your decision, but I want you to know that I'll be with you for the long haul no matter what. You're still you, and I love you. Oh, that's which romantic. Which is why his book is called Still Me. And he stated that after that, he never, ever considered it again. He lived for another nine years before passing away on October 10th, 2004 of heart failure, which was a result of the condition that he had of being a quadriplegic. His wife, Dana, lived another two years after his death, so not very long. She died on March 6, 2006. She was 44. Wow. She died of lung cancer despite never smoking cigarettes in her entire life. How does that happen? It was very bizarre. I read a bunch of stuff well, about mean, her. Well, I back in the day, though. People smoked like But chimneys. most people would say like, I mean, this was, she died in 2006. She was 44. You know, it's not like she was very old at all. Not, uh, so, okay, this is going to be, I don't know if this is going to age me or whatever, but we used to have dare in school. I don't know if they still have dare in school. Uh, what is it? Uh, drug awareness, resistance, education. I remember um, dare. I signed the contract stating I wouldn't do all the things I did literally <laughs> years later. What? Like a couple of years later. Oh my God. Uh, anyway. The events and the people that hosted it were such douchebags i was like i'm gonna smoke because of you now oh god anyway so one of the police officers uh the one that i would see most often come to school and do all that stuff i don't even remember if there was anybody else that ever came to teach us about dare but he got lung cancer and when he went to the doctor's office he's like i've never smoked i've never once smoked but the doctor's like, what about everybody you work with at the station right. or whatever? And he's like, holy shit. It's all that it, because it's coming off of everybody else's cigarettes and you're hanging out with them because they're your friends and whatever. But even if you don't smoke, if you're around all that stuff, it's still going to happen to you're you. You're eventually just going to breathe it in. Yeah. So, I mean, he's fine now. But when, when he got, good. yeah. Well, I don't know if he's still alive. That was like 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, yeah. So, I mean... Yeah, that's scary. It, and even though she never smoked a single cigarette in her life, it doesn't. They didn't even put the laws in where you can't smoke in places till yeah. way later, right? I mean, honestly, when I was old enough to start going to bars, like all the bars were just completely filled with smoke because everyone would go in and I, smoke. I remember the um, casinos when yeah. I used to come visit Vegas. The casinos would be filled with smoke. And if you watch old timey movies, it's like doctors are diagnosing patients just fucking smoking cigarettes <laughs> and blowing it into open wounds. Oh, like, what? <laughs> It was like, maybe it wasn't that bad, but doctors would just smoke cigarettes like chain smoke in hospitals and shit. So it was like, it was something that definitely happened for a very, very long time. And Dana Reeve died on March 6, 2006 of lung cancer despite never smoking cigarettes. So it is very sad. She is mentioned when it comes to the Superman curse. Um, even though I feel like her life had a lot of other challenges that weren't really related to the Superman yeah. franchise. Right. Which she met pretty well, like a fucking badass. Yeah. And uh, I think it's awesome. I think it's super fucking romantic. Superman's Lois Lane, so the love interest for Christopher Reeve on screen, was a lady by the name of Margot Kidder, 
who is often mentioned in the telling of the curse because of one specific incident. She went missing in April of 1996 for several days. Everyone feared the worst before she was located in a paranoid and delusional state. She just kind of went a little bit nuts and disappeared. They found her and she was a little bit nuts. She Did got she just some, snap one day? Yeah, essentially. She got some help and she got some medication. Um, she had previously been diagnosed with, I think at the time it was, um, I can't remember what they used to call bipolar disorder, but what we know is okay. bipolar disorder. And it really kind of pisses me off because it's something that's frequently mentioned about her. And it was like this one incident, a single event out of her life. Like a person's not a diagnosis. And I really don't like it when people mention stuff like this in curses or like events that kind of discount the fact that she had a pretty healthy life Up until and a that good point. career. Like, she did drink, you know, she did do drugs, but, like, she wasn't this crazy lady who did a bunch of stupid bullshit to try and, like, make it seem like she was cursed. In fact, she, despite being someone who's treated like they're crazy in the media, uh, very was very loudly outspoken that the curse was a bunch of bullshit wow. that people just sort of put together. And she talked about a specific incident where she got into a car accident and they asked her if that was part of the curse. And she's like, yes, I got into a car accident. Yes, I hit a pole. That pole stopped me from going off a cliff. So I'm super lucky, and I don't think that's a curse. I think it saved my life. Wow. And so no one ever brought up that. And you can't find that car accident anywhere anymore since she had that interview. And she lived until May 13th, 2018. So recently, about a year and a half ago, she passed away. She was found unresponsive by a friend. After an investigation, her cause of death was ruled to be self-inflicted drug and alcohol overdose. So she did pass away. It just from seems that. like a lot of this is super depressing. These people suffered from a lot of depression. And I did warn you that this and... was not going to be the happiest oh of topics. Um, so then we're going to move on to Superman's father, Jor-El, who was very famously played by incredibly famous actor Marlon Brando. So uh, Marlon Brando has been in a lot. He's the Godfather in the original Godfather. He's in Apocalypse Now. He's in a bunch of stuff. And he what was one he of the. Like? I mean, I'll have to show you pictures of him because he looks different throughout time. Like I see Marlon Brando as Godfather, you know, but he looks very different than that in Apocalypse Now. So he's a very versatile actor. I've think, never seen either of those. Think Gary Oldman, okay? Think how Gary Oldman, like you know what Gary Oldman looks like. He basically looks like Commissioner Gordon until you watch Fifth Element. You're like, that's fucking Gary Oldman. And yeah. You watch Dracula, like that's Gary Oldman too. It's like he can look like anything. I just <laughs> there's a meme that's like you're in this movie. And or you're watching this movie and all this stuff, and you wake up and you realize you are Gary Oldman. That's funny. I was just like, he can play anybody he wants to be. He can be you. He is great. But Marlon Brando, super famous actor, gets cast to play Jor-El in the 1978 iteration of Superman. And he really was one of the biggest movie stars on the planet at the time. And then a bizarre incident occurred with his family in 1990, 12 years later. His daughter, Cheyenne, was visiting with her boyfriend of four years, Dag Drollet, which is just... Who names their kid Dag? Very unique name. It is very unique. She was visiting Marlon Brando. While she was there, she was eight months pregnant at the time. Another of Marlon Brando's children named Christian Brando was also present, meeting Dag for the first time on May 16th. So... Marlon Brando apparently had, like, 11 kids. He had a lot Whoa. of kids. So Christian and Cheyenne were half-brother-sister. That's a lot of kids. Yeah, it is. But, but they had is a it good... all with one person? No. Oh, okay. So <laughs> Christian and Cheyenne had a good relationship. They went to dinner on May 16th. And during that dinner, uh, Cheyenne told Christian that Dag, her boyfriend, uh, was physically abusive to <gasps> her. Oh, and no. And had been during the pregnancy. As a side note, it appears now that this may have been entirely untrue. Okay. Not sure why she stated this, if it was untrue, but this is what was stated to him at this dinner. Later that night, back at the house, Christian became intoxicated and confronted Dag regarding the treatment of his sister. Christian, of course, made sure he did so while holding a gun. <gasps> No. He claimed that he was only trying to scare Dag as he brandished this weapon back and forth. Dag attempted to take it from him at some point. A scuffle ensued with the gun going off and Dag Drawlett was killed. Okay, so maybe Cheyenne was just like, I hate this guy. Maybe he wasn't abusive to me, but I just need him out of my life. Whatever it was, this is what was told to Christian. And Christian reacted by trying to confront him and basically say, stay the fuck away from my sister or I'll kill you, most likely. Which I think every brother or anyone who has anyone they care about out there can understand stating that to someone who you think is being physically abusive to someone you care about. Yeah. It escalated and someone wound up dead. And uh, 
what happens here is Christian goes to trial and he gets sentenced for manslaughter and he has a term of five years. Five years for manslaughter? Five years for manslaughter. During the trial, Cheyenne attempted suicide twice, but was unsuccessful. Um, On April 16th, 1995, a year before Christian was set to be released, Cheyenne, who was distraught over losing custody of her daughter, hanged herself in her mother's house in Tahiti. So wait, why did she lose custody? Because she was having a lot of issues because she had... A mental illness. Okay. And that's said to be possibly the reason why she decided to tell her brother that Dag was abusive to her, even though for it looks like all accounts he actually wasn't. Um, so it's it's really unknown, but April 16th, 1995, she killed herself. Uh, during Christian's trial, Marlon Brando actually took the stand. And during his time on the stand, he stated very famously, quote, I think perhaps I failed as a father. Wow. After this incident, he did become a recluse. I don't know if he was ever in a movie again after that. Um, I didn't check his IMDb page because I was like, this is just really, really sad. Um, There are other iterations of folks that have supposedly been affected by this curse. Like, if you look up this curse, you can find everyone down to the people who package the DVDs. Having stuff that happened to them, like supposedly uh, the DVDs for Superman Returns, I think, specifically. Um, But the last three I'll relate to you because this is already pretty long are relatively short, and they're not as heavy. And I put them at the end here specifically for this. Kate Bosworth, who played Lois in Superman Returns in 2006, broke up with her then-boyfriend Orlando Bloom due to the amount of time they spent apart. They had a rocky relationship because a lot of very famous actors don't get to see each other very often. Um, And he was filming Pirates of the Caribbean. She was filming Superman. And the tabloid stated that she personally credited their breakup to the Superman curse Mainly because during Superman, they didn't see each other, and that was, like, the last straw. Okay. A recent event that happened that's being credited now to the Superman curse is a young actress by the name of Allison Mack, who played the role of Chloe on Smallville, being accused of being involved in a sex trafficking ring in 2018. On April 8th, 2019, she pled guilty to racketeering (gasps) conspiracy and racketeering charges but has not yet been sentenced. Is that the chick from Beauty and the Beast? I don't know who the chick is from Beauty and the Beast. There's a million iterations of Beauty and the Beast, but this particular person... The TV show, that that, that live-action TV show? You folks can let us know if Allison Mack is in the live-action TV show. What I can tell you is I read an interview with Tom Welling, who is the Superman... Oh, the role of Chloe. I think she was Lois. Okay. Okay, I don't know who Chloe is. So I read an interview with... Or was there a Lois? I don't even know. Never mind. There was eventually a Lois, yes. Oh, okay. I've never seen Smallville. Sorry. So I read an interview with Tom Welling, who is the Superman of Smallville, and he talked about how she never really ever brought it up, but she did ask everyone, like, on set at one point, just once, if they, like, wanted to come with her to this weird meeting she was really into. I thought she was, she was really in a into. sex cult. She was just in a sex cult. It wasn't just a cult. They did trafficking of young girls, Holy too. Holy shit. So he said, like, it was kind of weird. I told her, like, yeah, it's not my thing, and she didn't press him on it. Is that the guy that's in Lucifer? Tom Welling? Yeah, that's the guy who plays Kane and Lucifer. Okay, cool. So, yeah, that's a real thing. It happened, and she pled guilty to two two charges. Racketeering, by the way, is basically like when you have, like, organized crime. Like, that's what a racket is considered, and if you're part of it, it's racketeering. So, uh, the last one I'm going to speak on is truly the oldest iteration of the Superman curse. Writer Jerry Siegel and artist Joe Schuster are the creators of the character known as Superman. They sold the rights for their character, Superman, to Detective Comics, which is what DC stands for. How much did they sell them for? For $130. Shut the fuck up. Oh my god, you guys could be rich as balls right now. In 1938, that is the equivalent of selling something for $2,369.26 in 2020. Oh my god. (laughs) Here's another thing too, I don't know if I have this in here. The most recent auction, because this check is very famous now, that they took. Uh, The check sold for $160,000, the last auction from the last collector who wanted to have it. What? By the mid-1940s, and just to reiterate, I'm pretty sure he was created in 1938. They conceptualized Uh, him in the late 30s. 1938 is when he was sold. Oh my god, that's so painful. I hurt for them. By the mid-1940s, so maybe seven, eight years later, DC had removed their names from the comic, (gasps) giving them credit for creating him. Rude. They would attempt to get back the rights to Superman for most of their lives after that because it was such a profitable entity and they felt taken advantage of. And on top of that, they weren't being given credit anymore for creating him. And they were often rebuked frequently by lawyers and judges because realistically they did sell full rights to Detective Comics. 
And, like, every time they'd apply for, like, the copyright to be moved to them, they'd be told, like, no, dude, like, you sold, you it. sold it. Like, it's legally binding. It's gone forever. Oh, my F. So they have, I mean, DC Comics, they have no reason why they should say created by so-and-so because, Except I mean, to give credit to the two people who created Superman. But at the same time, it's like, you sold it to us. We own it now. They own it. But we they have, don't put they, anything in there about who created it. But and they that's don't just have so to. Shitty. They don't have to. They're they don't not required have to, to. But it's shitty. But it is like, very shitty. This is going to have a good ending. So let me get to I'm it. I'm pointing at the monitor like there's a camera there. But I know. <laughs> so this does have a good ending. So Schuster, I mean, it gets really sad. Schuster, oh, no. despite being an artist, making his living as an artist, wound up developing terrible eyesight that would leave him nearly blind very early oh, in life. Oh, man. There's a story that during during his time finding other jobs because he could no longer draw, he took a job as a delivery man to make money, and he actually had to deliver a package to the D.C. <gasps> building. Oh, shut up. Apparently, it caused such embarrassment at the D.C. office while he was there that the CEO of D.C. called him to his office, gave him a $100 bill, told him to buy a new coat and get a different job, and then told him to get the fuck out. So What an asshole i put told him to get the fuck out he obviously probably didn't say that but it's not like he gave him credit or gave him a job or a cre- like anything it would have been nice give him a hundred dollar to- bill said buy a coke get a new job and then told him to leave he should have just been like hey you know what we could use some story writers some uh character developers or something like that anything you know, you know? uh by 1976 schuster was living in a nursing home at the age of 62 due to his eyesight and being legally blind Jerry Siegel, the writer who helped create uh, Superman, started a publicity campaign to show the treatment of himself and co-creator Siegel at the hands of DC. Now, with the new movie coming out in 1978, it did not take long for Warner, DC's parent company, to become involved in the matter. They restored their names to the comic for the first time in over 30 years. That's good. 30 years their creation didn't have their names on it. Issue 302 that came out in August of 1976 is the first issue after 30 years that have their name on it. It's very, very popular to be collected. And it had both Siegel and Schuster. Uh, I'm sorry, Warner gave both Siegel and Schuster a lifetime pension of $20,000 a year plus health benefits. In case you're wondering, $20,000 in 1976 is the 2020 equivalent of $90,324.78. And that's... That's like, um, because this guy was like, dude, you, you gotta see how shitty they treat us, the creators of fucking Superman. People had started to forget they were the ones who created him. Straight up. They were just like, they don't even know who created Superman. They're like, it was us. Also, we're given no credit, and we're treated like shit. So, one particular individual regarding the curse that I'm gonna move on to now to kind of get this starting to wrap up. Wait, where's, where's Henry Cavill gonna come in here? Let me just finish. Okay. I'll one, let partic- you finish. one particular individual who has not yet, as far as we know, been affected by the curse is an actor by the name of Henry Cavill, who is the most recent and hopefully, fingers crossed, current iteration of live action Superman for the movies. Doesn't he only have one left? What do you mean one left? One movie left? On his contract? Yeah. No, I'm pretty sure he's done so. Which is no, why he I, did not do the cameo in in Shazam. Is I, I they're thought still they're going to actually... Oh, they're renegotiating that whole thing. Okay. Yeah. So, he might have one left, and that's why he didn't do Shazam. Because if he did Shazam, that would have fulfilled his obligation for his last one. Because it would have technically been an appearance. FYI, the person who is the Superman that makes the cameo is only shot from the neck down. That is the stuntman for Zachary Levi in the movie Shazam. It's not Henry Cavill. So, may I just say... That whatever demon haunts this franchise, if you even think about messing with Henry Cavill, <laughs> I will wrap my fist with trainer's tape, dip them in glue, cover them in salt and crosses, what about gummy bears? pull out a Ouija board, oh, summon God. you forth, and whoop your ass back to the deepest, darkest pit of hell. Because I fucking love Henry Cavill. And no, I didn't just make that routine up out of thin air because all I did there was add the glue and the salt and the crosses because when someone speaks ill of Henry Cavill in my presence, I wrap these hands and commence to whooping ass. Because so- that is my dude. I fucking love oh him. Oh my god. Seriously, what? I thought you love Chris Hemsworth. I love Chris Hemsworth because he's a beautiful human being. He's very tall and I think he's funny. I love Henry Cavill on a very different level. I've said it before on the podcast. I will say it again. Yeah, about when you saw him when he Count was a Monte Cristo. Oh my he was God. like 16 at the time. And that part at the end where he says, you let me fight him. I was just like, holy shit. I got to remember his name. That kid's going to be fucking famous one day. 
He's just very good. I've said that before, and I take a lot of shit for this too. I'm a DC fan. I read both DC and Marvel growing up. I loved X-Men and Spider-Man from Marvel. I love Batman and Superman from DC. I will say it always, Batman is my favorite superhero of all time. Superman is a very close third. Spider-Man is second. And we can sit around for ages and debate what entity does what best, but I can honestly say that my favorite crossover event will forever be the death of Superman. I had this super nerdy little suitcase, which was just a little bit bigger than a lunchbox. I used to carry my comics in it. I used to take it to school and read my comics out of it. And if I got made fun of for it, I was either too busy reading my comics to notice or people had the good grace to make fun of me behind my back and I never found out about it. I kept my most recent recent issue in my little suitcase and I kept seven other comics in there. Those seven comics were as follows. Action Comics 684, Adventure of Superman 497, JLA 69, Superman the Man of Steel 18 and 19, and Superman 74 and 75. How Superman do you 75. All these Superman 75 is the only one I remembered. I had to look up the other ones. I just knew I had seven there because this is the arc that was the there's three arcs for Death of Superman and this is the first arc where he dies. Superman 75 is the issue where Superman dies. And I would read that cuz they were so fucking good and like I loved it when it rained so we could have indoor recess in third or fourth grade so I could read my comics and like Comics have these little square cells that are meant for narration for who, anyone who has never read them. You know, the, there's these little square cells because like chat bubbles are that dialogue bubble that you've always seen where it's like a bubble with an arrow. If it's inner thoughts of a character, it's like the frilly bubble that looks like a cloud. And if it's narration being told not from the perspective of anyone, it's a box that's typically yellow. And Superman 60 or I'm sorry, Superman 75, the last two pages have those little boxes and it's like Superman's laying there in complete rubble. And like Doomsday's lifeless body is next to him. By the way, he wasn't dead. And Lois is holding him in her arms. And he's all sorts of fucked up. And those narration boxes say, for this is the day. And then you turn the page and it shows him dead. And it says that a Superman died. And it doesn't say, cry? shut up. It doesn't say Superman. It says that a Superman died. Because it's about him being like a really good person. And I was like seven or eight or nine. I was like, oh, like it occurred to me what they were doing with it. And that's why those comics are very, very special to me. And I think it's kind of cool because it's also very sad. But when I covered this curse, I thought about all these people that played him and like all the things they dealt with because they were just normal people. And then their alter ego was Superman on the big screen, this character that can literally do anything. And they had their demons that they were fighting through and all the things they were trying to get through and they were just people, you know, they were sincerely just people that had to deal with so much shit because when you're a creative person and you feel like you're failing, like you're very, very, very hard on yourself and you see the themes of depression and mental illness and alcoholism and drug abuse come into this curse a lot. And I think that it's not necessarily a curse. Those things are all things I think we can understand, if not even relate to. Um, but I thought about this a lot when I was going through this curse, like, It just reminded me of how, like, human they make him seem in that arc when he dies. Because they really don't reference, like, these amazing feats that this character did. It's like Clark Kent was the person who died. And I think a lot of the actors who have had this role, like, feel like they're in the shadow of the character. Because it's this character that can do impossible things. But it's like, the character's not Superman. The character's really Clark Kent or Kal-El or whatever you call him. Because... He really is just an, literally an alien trying to be a human being, you know? Yeah. And it's like that monologue in Kill Bill where Bill talks about, like, how Superman is the actual person and Clark Kent is the alter ego, the, like, the mask. Mm-hmm. And, of course, he's, like, weak and frail and that's how he views the human race. It's like, no, he's just trying to be one of us, like, living in this world where he consistently has to become, like, this super amazing, super powerful person just to, like, make it through or protect people. Mm-hmm. But it's like... We do that, we're like people live in that world too that don't have the ability to do that. So I always just read it differently where it's like, I think he kind of like looks up to humans. Where it's like the character of Superman would look up to the actors that play them because they struggle through so much shit while pretending to be these perfect people. Okay. So I just thought it was a really cool way to wrap up like when you think about it that way. So what have we learned from all this? Well, we know for sure that drinking drugs and guns do not mix. Yep, no, don't do it. 
Don't do any of those things unless they're individual, separately, and prescribed by I mean, a doctor in most cases. Okay. Uh, everyone has demons that they're fighting, regardless of what image they project of themselves. So try and keep that in mind if you're ever dealing with a person that's difficult. Don't be you never that, know what they're going through. Don't be that rude person that talks shit about somebody. Yeah. You don't want to be the person that's like, he's going to go shoot himself right now. Yeah. No. You know, that's fucked up. And this franchise may be cursed. Or it may just be a series of unfortunate events. And maybe a curse and a series of unfortunate events are the same things, just labeled differently. But I do sincerely hope for the best for everyone who works on this franchise in the future. And that, my spooky friends, is The Curse of Superman. Nice. That was, uh, I'm not going to read a topic now because that was the whole episode. Thank you no, and good night. You were totally reading a topic. You don't get off that easy. I know it was long, but hey, sometimes they're long. So uh, that's the end of mine. But before we move on to Robbins, we're going to take a quick Commercial break. Beep boop ba up. Beep boop ba up. <laughs> and we're back. Some weird sounds to return us, but whatever. So what are you covering this week, Robin? All right. So I know that usually it's Adam with the aliens, but this week I'm bringing in the extraterrestrials. Uh, I'm doing the Kelly Hopkinsville Encounter, also known as the Hopkinsville Goblins. This um, sounds awesome aliens or... <laughs> and goblins also in my defense i did cover an alien his name is kal oh my god and he's from Shut krypton up. okay uh also known as the kelly greenman case uh not greenman like the person but green men <laughs> case uh and it takes us back to 1955 in rural christian county kentucky and the encounter is named so because it happened near kelly and Hopkinsville in said county. So it's just like in between towns. Um, they so couldn't it, decide it's like which cross- one was going to be named yeah. after. So, 1955 had a lot going on for it. I looked up at like this historical events list thing. I thought it was really cool. Uh, the Ford Thunderbird gets produced for the first time. Uh, the first Crown Vic was made. Multiple sclerosis gets the first official name, or not the first official name, but they get the official name. Multiple sclerosis. One of the things and, I didn't uh, include in my script, Richard Pryor was in Superman 3. Three years after being in Superman 3, he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Dang. Yeah, just because uh, I was like, that doesn't necessarily mean it's Superman's fault, but that was one of the other things that yeah. was on the internet quite a bit. Yeah. Um, Albert Einstein died. Aw. James Dean had his horrific car accident and died. We've covered um, that one. Yeah, so if you guys haven't heard that episode yet, you guys can hop on over. We've already done an episode on James Dean's car. Uh, it's crazy, so check it out. Obi-Wan Break Kenobi two. himself warned him that the car was evil. I'm the just saying. OG Obi-Wan Kenobi, not Ewan McGregor for you younger generation. He's not a time traveler. I'm pretty sure he wasn't um, born in 1955. <laughs> uh, Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, the book gets released. Uh, obviously not the movie because it's 1955. <laughs> um, Bill Gates is born. It's kind of cool. My dad was born. Oh, cute. Um, There were multiple plane crashes that year, which is crazy because that doesn't really happen too often. Statistically, it's the safest way to travel because it's very infrequent. Um, And then there was the Kelly Hopkinsville encounter. And what's crazy is that different lists of historical events include this encounter on it, which I think is absolutely crazy that this thing was such a big deal in 1955 that they were just like, we got to include it. It happened, you know? Um, It's supposedly one of the most significant and well-documented cases of UFO encounters. It's even in the United States Air Force's uh, Project Blue Book thing. And um, I cannot wait to cover Project Blue Book. I think we're going to have to do multiple episodes for that. Yeah, I even brought up, I was like, I didn't know if you have actually covered that or, or whatnot, but I think uh, you might have grazed over it in a couple of episodes. I mentioned it twice, yeah. Um, what I think is interesting is that the U.S. Air Force had to create something specifically to deal with aliens. It's just so insane. To investigate all the cases, um, and it was open. Project Blue Book went on for like three, two or three decades. Yeah, it's it's absolutely crazy. There's I, a TV show coming out called Project Blue Book, which is, is it's really? going to be like the X Files, but a cheaper version of it because they, it's like they legitimately did investigate all those cases, though. That would be cool to watch. Yeah, it's a good premise. I don't know if it's going to be executed well, but yeah, that's coming out. Okay, uh, Alan Hendry wrote, I think he's a a UFOologist or an ufologist or whatever. Um, He wrote that, 
quote, this case is distinguished by its duration and also by the number of witnesses involved, end quote. So a lot of people saw this thing, okay? So, um, all right. So what happened in Kentucky to make this such a big deal, you might ask? Uh, well, I'm going to tell you, and uh, I'm going to tell you wh- however which way I can. The data might be a little mixed up or whatnot, but we want to remind everybody that we are not scientists, we're not historians, we're not ufologists or ufologists or... We're just or, nerds. Yeah, we're just nerds that do a podcast. Um, I've heard it called ufologist on other podcasts, so I think that's the funner way to say it. And I'm going to say it, Val. Ufologists. <laughs> millennial way to say it okay no um all right so august 21st 1955 it's evening time probably after dinner or something like that everyone's full on delicious food probably i don't know but five adults and seven children show up at the hopkinsville police station all claiming to have seen what they believe to be small alien creatures and that's a lot of people. What is that? 11 people? 5 plus 7? 12? 12 people? Um, wow. Future engineers of America, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so they reported that these creatures came out of a spaceship and started attacking their farmhouse. Supposedly, they had to be holding the group of creatures off by gunfire. So they had to to keep these things away from their home. They had to keep shooting at it. Quote, for nearly four hours, end quote. Um, Two of the adults, Elmer Sutton and Billy Ray Taylor, claimed to have shot at 12 or 15 of these dark, short figures who repeatedly appeared in their doorway and peered through their windows. Um, So you said they were attacking the farmhouse. (laughs) It kind of sounds like they're peeping Toms. Yeah, where they're just like, hey, what's up? Let us in. Uh, You got to invite us in. Wow. (laughs) They're vampires. Um, some ufologists compare the creatures to gremlins, hence the name Hopkinsville Goblins. Um, Billy had left the Sutton house to go grab some water from the family well, as there was no plumbing in the home. It's 1955. I'm sure that's, I mean, it happens, right? Older homes. Apparently, yeah. Um, while he was at the well, he saw a shiny object land in a small gully about a quarter of a mile away. He ran back to the house to report what he saw, and supposedly everybody just laughed at him and didn't believe him, which, I mean, if somebody came back in the house and was like, dude, I saw this weird thing fall out of the sky, you know, whatever, you're going to be like, ah, yeah, whatever, Bob. I'd be like, go Facebook Live, I'll watch it from the safety of my home while you go investigate. So no one went to check on what it was that he could have possibly seen. Uh, Sources differ as to whether someone actually went out eventually, or if the group of creatures came to the farmhouse. So um, whether or not someone actually went to go check on stuff eventually or whatever, uh, either way, they, when they were seen, it seemed like these creatures were wearing some side, some type of shiny suit, like a shiny silver suit. Uh, They walked upright and had thin and long limbs. Their movements were strange. Like they floated and they swayed as if they were walking through water. And I think that's creepy in and of itself. That's probably not very hard to do if you're trolling someone. Maybe gravity is different on their Um, planet. Or maybe this is all a bunch of lies. I can't (laughs) wait to find out which. The family dog was barking like mad and even went to hide under the house. And when I read that, I was like, this sounds like something from Signs. It just sounds like they came out of the corn. I mean, I'm sure M. Night Shyamalan did his research on like alien sightings. Yeah. That makes That's sense. That's probably why it sounds like something out of okay. signs. So the dog stayed under the house until the next day. Once the creatures began appearing in the windows and doorways, shots were fired because apparently everybody had a bunch of guns. Um, it's Kentucky. <laughs> one such shot uh, was point blank at one of the creatures and supposedly sent the creature backwards into the yard where Elmer... Um, witnessed the creature scurry away on all fours like a dog would. Uh, One of the other men went out onto their porch to check out what might be going on because they see all these things popping up, you know. Um, Another one of the creatures had... I feel like whoever went outside had to have yelled, What in tarnation? Oh my, that's just... 
Okay. Probably accurate. So another one, no, another one of the creatures had climbed up onto the roof. So when the guy came towards the edge of that porch, the creature came down, like swung down and grabbed his hair with some, like compared to the body of the creature, an oversized hand that was like claws. So grabbed onto this dude's hair. And eventually the guy was able to get out of the grip of this thing and he ran back inside where a shootout started. Wow. Supposedly. Uh, the family huddled within the home with locked doors and they claimed to have heard like the pitter patter of footsteps outside. Did they get at her? Oh, my pitter patter. Let's get at her. Uh, or the sounds of like tapping on the windows. So they either heard scurrying or tapping. I would freak out if that were me, if that actually happened. Um, all right. So. Understandably, after being told the story, the local authorities were like, we need to do something about this. This is terrifying. They feared for the public safety and the possible gunfight between citizens, because if this was just other people... Like pranking them. Right. Um, So a whole bunch of authorities came together to figure out what was going on. They had four city police, five state troopers, three deputy sheriffs... And four MPs from the local Fort Campbell U.S. Army base. Wow. Um, and MPs are military police. Right. So, uh, okay. So, they all drove down to this farm that was near Kelly, and they all they found were a bunch of bullet holes and some shattered windows, and there was, I mean, there was definitely evidence of a gunfight, you know, that had happened because there's damage everywhere. But that was it. They even had, like, little tiny pinhole... Not pinholes, but they had little tiny bullet holes in the screens of the door. So they were shooting out of the door, too, you know? Um, But that's all they found. So they saw something that made them shoot up their own home. And the the police didn't find any bodies or anything like that. Um, Maybe they turn invisible when they die. Or they disintegrate into dust like vampires. Or they don't exist. (laughs) Uh, So... We've covered all three options at this so point. So those that witnessed the whole ordeal were Glennie Langford, her children, Lonnie Carlton and Mary, as well as her two sons from a previous marriage, Elmer and John Charlie Sutton. So they had their wives, Vera and Aileen, as well as Alan's brother, um, and then Billy Ray Taylor. So he was the one of the dudes that went to... He went out to grab the water okay. from the well. Okay. So, according to sources on the interwebs, both of the tailors, as well as Elmer Sutton, were carnival workers that were visiting the farmhouse. Why that matters is beyond me, but multiple sources were like, they're carnival workers. Some people think it's like, that's what makes it more believable. It's that they're carnival workers or something like that. I don't know. But, uh... I don't see how that has anything to do with anything. No. According to neighbors' reports to the police the following day, the families all, quote-unquote, packed up and left after claiming that, quote, the creatures had returned about 3.30 in the morning, end quote. Um, I get that there are no cameras, like no no uh, camera phones or anything back then that you could have just been like, let's take a snap at it. There's no quick little tiny digital cameras or anything like that. Um, it, it's 1955, though. There should be some type of, like, video camera, maybe, or something. It would have been, know. like, a photograph? Like, you could t- you could have taken a photograph, but I don't think, like, a family of this means living in this area would have had the ability to buy, like, some form of video capture equipment. Yeah. I just don't get how there's no tangible evidence of these things coming at them, you know? Um, I mean, there's I guess- bullet holes. That's tangible. I guess if everyone was scared that they were scared enough that they were shooting at everything, no one really had the opportunity or the ability, even if they had cameras or anything like that, to actually pick one up and be like, we got to Facebook Live this, you know? (laughs) Yeah. What I will say, too, that lends a little bit of credence towards this is there's that many people in this house. They shot this many rounds. And if it was a bunch of people playing pranks on them, one of them would have been shot, you know? Right. Or hurt in some way where it would have left some evidence. Or someone would have told someone, like, hey, we pranked them really good. Yeah. That would have leaked out at some point, so. After the incidents of that night, the media was all over it. I'm sure they were just like, more aliens, we gotta get on this, you know? The family received widespread attention from both local and national press, 
As with any story that spreads and gets told over and over again, details change. Um, Like playing telephone, you know, uh, everyone's trying to tell the story, but then they want people to read their article. So it's like... Sensationalize it. Right. Um, The size of the creatures vary from like two to four feet because so many people told the story over and over again, no one really knows. Um, In later news stories, they began adding facts that weren't in the original statements. So they started calling them, quote unquote, little green men, even though they weren't at all said to be green in the original reports. They're in silver suits, right? Um, yeah. So it's it's funny how media does this, how news reporting works. It's just they, they want something that's super catchy. So it's like, they're little green men, you know? Everything has to get a nickname. We've talked about this with serial killers, too. They give serial killers catchy nicknames, which just feeds into, like, their psychosis that they're going through where they think that they're... Like some mythological person, now all of a sudden they have a fucking nickname and they yeah. actually believe that. Yeah. Extra details like the creatures having large pointed ears, claw like hands, eyes that glowed yellow with spindly legs were also things that were added later. So it's just a lot of sensationalizing, like you were saying. There are those that do try to explain away what it was that the family was visited by. Some say that these aliens were simply great horned owls, which has been the explanation for aliens in multiple instances and encounters. So many people are like, it's just an owl. Um, Unless it's La Lucesa, which is an owl witch, which will carry your ass away. (laughs) The, The thing that confuses me is how could this owl possibly look anything like an alien? Maybe it had a silver suit on. It just doesn't make sense to me. Some people were saying, like, the way the the feathers reflect or something like that, it might have been silverish. I don't know. But these great horned owls, I didn't see any pictures where it was, like, silver or gray enough to kind of look silver. They're brown. Yeah. Um, I stood next to one and oh, petted yeah? it. Oh, oh, yeah. That, that In Japan, we went to an owl cafe, and um, it was awesome. Some say that all these individuals happened to be intoxicated or drunk at the time. According to Joe Nickel, uh, meteors were also seen across the sky at the time of the incident. Billy Ray Taylor, one of those witnesses to the creatures, claimed that he saw, quote, a bright light streak across the sky and saw it disappear behind a tree line some distance from the house, end quote. So some sources say that the thing that he saw was silent, when walking, which is apparently an attribute to great horned owls when they fly. They're absolutely silent when they move around. Oh, wow, I did not um, know that. Yeah, I didn't know that you either. You know when they're not silent? When you accidentally press A when he's explaining to you all that bullshit when you go into Hyrule Field for the first time. I was... Because the, they transposed <laughs> yes and no on Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. I thought you were talking about the owl from Animal Crossing because I totally spam A when he's talking That's to That's funny. Owls talk too much in video games is what we're saying here. Um. All right. It's funny, though, when you wake him up from sleeping. Anyway, okay. So I think that that's pretty in-depth and well-said observation for someone who's said to have been drunk at the time you know what i mean it's pretty detailed i don't know so they're said to have been drunk were they not tested they did not test the blood alcohol i don't think they did these folks? plus um after so much time i mean they went to the police to tell them like dude this is what we saw and the police went and checked by that time they're probably getting sober if they were drunk i imagine as soon as someone walks through the door of my police station and says i saw an alien the first thing i'm gonna do is make him blow in a breathalyzer oh my F. just to check all right so in 1957 u.s air force major john e albert concluded that it was a monkey that was painted with silver that had probably escaped from a local circus which to me makes The least sense. Right? (laughs) It's not a nothing monkey. It's like you're just trying to make up anything that would make sense. And it's like, I guess this is as close as we can get. A monkey painted silver sound good to everyone? Yeah, just write that in the official report. Whatever. So what makes this whole thing seem even more unbelievable and seemingly hoax-ish is that even ufologists don't really believe that it could have been aliens as the family claimed to have seen. So one of them, Jerome Clark, Uh, wrote that these creatures seem to have quote-unquote floated through the trees and that when bullets did hit the creatures, it quote, resembled bullets striking a metal bucket, end quote. And he also described, quote, an odd luminous patch along a fence where one of the beings had been shot 
and in the woods beyond, a green light whose source could not be determined, end quote. But apparently, the source of the light may have been um, this thing called foxfire, which is a bio- bioluminescent fungus that appears on decaying wood. And when I read that, I was like, no, that doesn't exist. There's nothing way. Because um, it's hard to believe. It, it reminded me of the glowing stuff that you find on trees in Fallout 76. Wow. And so I was just like, nah, this is a video game thing. There's no way. You know those really um, shiny mushrooms? The, yeah. The, the, the rad mushroom things? Um, yeah, that's what it reminded me of. But the pictures of this thing look really cool. If you, Clearly, we're going to have one on our yeah, Instagram. Yeah, if you look at pictures of Foxfire, I was just like, what? That is so freaking cool. That uh, I don't know. I think it's weird that nature seems really alien sometimes because there's so many cool things that it does. Um, you can really understand why like, early man really saw nature as something that had to be like a deity or some god yeah. to be worshipped because what could be possibly making the sun move through the sky or making the trees glow or like when I did the Tunguska blast like what possibly like came into the earth's atmosphere and exploded knocking down all the trees yeah. all that stuff would just seem so like beyond human comprehension especially at the time where it had to have been something that's like alien or something celestial in some way shape or form yeah um Clark also points out inconsistencies with investigations and reports, newspapers, etc. Like, the fact that you have these UFO enthusiasts, these experts in the field saying, like, dude, no, it's not aliens, is insane to me. The fact that even they're like, nah, 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 dog, it's not. Um, I wonder if they pick certain cases to deny. That way they can seem like they don't claim everything is actually aliens. That I can see that. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, neighbors... like the, the less reliable the witness testimony, then that's when they tend to be like, nope, not aliens. Yeah. Stamp it down. So neighbors claim to have only ever heard four gunshots, which is a far cry from the shootout that the family claims to have had lasted over four hours. Right. Um, plus, I, how much ammo do you have that or it would last hours for four worth? hours? Well, would it be like I a mean, shootout come on. constantly, or would it be more like... Some initial shots, then a standoff, then a and few shots after that. And you just sit there, that. and you just keep hearing them, and then one pops into the window, and you shoot it again. Yeah. It's like a shooting gallery. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Except it's probably, like, slower paced, and it's... I, I wouldn't imagine it's, like, a John Woo film for four fucking hours. I heard... Uh, well, I didn't hear, because I read it. So I read on the internet that Sableye from Pokemon is uh, supposed to be kind of themed after these things. Really? That's why it has, like, the claw hands, and it's small... And it just has that stature to it. Um, that's the purple one with the diamond eyes. Yeah, I know, eyes. with okay. the diamond eyes. It's one of our things on Twitch when people donate to us. Oh, really? Yeah, Sableye? I think it's when we get hosted, or it might be when we get bits. So What? Yeah. I love Pokemon. Um, but, yeah, no, I was like, what? That's How is that possible? That's crazy. Um, but I don't know. It could all be bullshit, right? Uh, so, yeah, I'm sure that neighbors would have noticed a barrage of gunfire lasting over four hours. And plus, there were no bodies. There were so many shots fired. If there were so many shots fired, wouldn't there be blood? Or, like, some side of some type of green goop or something like something that? Something that shows evidence that there was something there. Right. Some splatter of some sort, black tar. Who knows? Just, like... Why would there be heroin there? That's just really weird. I hate weird. you. But I just... It doesn't make sense to me that they would shoot something and supposedly have shot something point blank with no splatter. Just saying. Or like metal shavings from the round if it actually hit something and it resembled when like a bullet hits metal. You figure there would be something showing shrapnel of the bullet that yeah. like, got shredded. I don't yeah. know. Some, some type of physical evidence should have been present. So the farmhouse even became a tourist attraction for a brief time, though it's said that the Suttons tried to keep it um otherwise so they were just like please get off our property type thing like can you guys just stay away on one hand it's like okay now you're famous so maybe it is a hoax and they just wanted the attention but why would you destroy your own house and turn away people that are showing up right that are tourists that you could like charge money to just to look at your house so yeah so for that i'm like maybe they did really see something and they just 
were like, uh, dude, no, <laughs> you know? Um, eventually the Suttons did refuse any visitors and stopped talking about it, but they still stood adamant about what it was that they saw. Even Elmer's daughter has said that growing up, her father stood by everything that he said and totally believed in what he saw, and she always felt like he really, really, really believed it. So, um... That was it, was, it was just something that shook them up, you know? Right. And even if she remembers, like, dude, my dad was definitely a believer in what they saw. Like, I don't know. You don't tell your kids something like that, and <laughs> it's a hoax. Right. Um, and if you do eventually, like, you'll back off the story, I would guess, or imagine, like, or change your details a little bit, but to be super staunch and adamant your entire life, like, this friggin' happened. Yeah. Like, what are you going to do with that? So, since the incident, news outlets have taken some liberties with it, obviously, like they tend to do. They add different flavor texts to it, like calling them Little Green Men. It was taking things like um, the case for the Little Green Men that came out in 1951, and then just having that little... It, it's like, aliens are themed right now. We gotta take this and run with it. And adjust the description to something that's more palatable to the audience. So, it's right. like, oh, I recognize that. I've heard about that exact thing before. Yeah, so... Um, it just went viral through newspapers, radios, etc. And it's not hard to see something like this grow and kind of take on a life of its own because, one, it's catchy. Two, it's aliens. People are just going to be like, holy crap, aliens. Right. You know? Um, these days, the people of Kelly celebrate the encounter of 1955 by having an event they call the Kelly Little Green Men Days. So... <laughs> Everything has to have... Some sort of festival to celebrate yep. it so they can capitalize on it with tourism. It's every third weekend of August. So if you guys ever want to head over there, check them out, hang out in rural Kentucky, uh, you go and do that. Right on. Yeah. That's pretty good. Thanks. I Aliens. Do, I really do wonder what it was. And uh, I got to say... I'm not exactly convinced that it was aliens, but I don't know. There's not a lot of I evidence on it, it, so it's really aliens. hard to know. I my honest my honest belief is that it wasn't aliens. I think it was just a family that saw something weird, and they might have experienced something that scared them, but I, I just can't believe that it's aliens. Yeah, call me a pragmatist or a skeptic, but I sincerely think this sounds more like the mole people who live at the center of our hollow earth than what? aliens, So, I, which is on our list of topics to cover, but every time I see it, I'm like, do I really, do I really want to go that deep down the rabbit um, hole? <laughs> But, uh, no, I think it could have been, al uh, not aliens, animals, some type of animal that was curious and saw these people inside this house and were like, yo, what's up? And, uh, not... But what kind of animal? Like a monkey that's been painted silver? I don't know, silver? meerkat. <laughs> wow. <laughs> they were tiny, right? Two to four feet. That's small. Yeah. Um, some sources were like leprechauns. Um, I was going to say, leprechauns did pop into my head at one point, but they're like, they, don't they just wear green and they're not actually green? I... Have we covered leprechauns before? I don't I mean, know. March 17th is like less than two months away, so I figured we're going to need to cover leprechauns for St. Patrick's Day. If we haven't Day. covered leprechauns, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that is the Kelly Hopkinsville encounter. Right on. That was really good. Thanks. Good stuff. It was just I feel... fun. I think it was just fun to speculate and fun to, even if we don't believe it, go over something that th that happened uh, to kind of wash the depressing taste out of my mouth. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> so... Sorry about all the depression. Jeez. Uh, yeah. I think we both had pretty good topics. I know mine ran a little long. I hope no one's upset about that. But I really got into the Superman thing because it is very near and dear to my heart. Yeah. So, as are aliens, but hopefully not too near or too dear because they do terrify me if they're real. It's just one of the most terrifying concepts out there. So, it's nice to hear that there was an encounter where UFOlogists or however you say it were just like, nah, this one's not real. Yeah. So, right on. Good stuff. I don't think we have a whole lot left for uh, episode 112 except to remind folks that if you want to donate to us monetarily, there's a few different ways to do so. Robin, let them know how they can. All right. So, like Adam was saying earlier this episode, January is... January Patreon push. No, 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 and so, no. <laughs> so go to patreon.com slash garish podcast. Those are monthly donations. We have a whole bunch of different tiers. And uh, you guys can check it out and help support us because we do want to go to the Stanley Hotel and hang out and see creepy things. Maybe take the ghost tour. Absolutely take um, the ghost tour. <laughs> and uh, I've never been out that way. So that'd be pretty cool. 
And then there's coffee, ko-fi.com slash garish podcast. Those are one-time donations. All those donations help to upgrading our studio setup. And we've been able to do that over the years that we've been doing this. It's crazy. Indeed. And it's all thanks to you guys. And we really couldn't do this without you. Everybody that donates on our live streams and things like that. Seriously, you help us just grow immensely immensely and we thank you guys so much every step that we take forward is a step towards us being able to do this more and more i mean realistically our dream is to do like live shows and travel and do stuff like that and i would absolutely love if we could produce content for a living and i don't know if it's a realistic thing it's definitely a dream but i gotta say i'm much closer to that dream actually becoming real because of all the folks that do support us And uh, it's a pretty humbling thing. So thank you so much to everyone who has supported us in any way, shape, or form, whether or not you sign up for Patreon, whether or not you just listen, or you share it with a friend, or or whatever it may be. You have made a difference in our lives, and we sincerely appreciate it. So uh, I do think that's everything we have for episode 112. Again, if you want to watch Storytime, it is Tuesday, 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time at YouTube.com slash Scaryish, or Twitch.tv slash Scaryish Podcast, and we hope to see you folks there, but... That's just about everything we got. So, Robin, go ahead and sign us out. Keep on creeping on, and we'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.